Orflex, we're about a thousand people worldwide now uh, working with some uh, uh, 40 uh, regulatory ID programs worldwide. So uh, just a, a, a quick gasp in uh, where you'll find us. Pretty well anywhere there is uh, ID and traceability across species, uh, you're going to find us. And it's this, uh, this experience on a global base that I, I want to express to you. Um, uh, I want to look at some global commonalities, the drivers in uh, 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 ID, if you like. So uh, often, uh, particularly when we're in veterinary circles, we like to couch things as uh, animal disease control. Uh, so it's, it's ep epidemiological. It's, uh, uh, but in reality, the drivers historically are economic. This is why countries actually have uh, uh, a traceability program. So we start with something very basic, food security. Uh, if animals die, uh, we, we can't eat. A bit of an issue, really. So uh, we don't want animals to eat, and we don't want to go short of food. Uh, things that help will be useful. Uh, preservation of a local economy. Uh, if I can't produce food or sell food in this area, it causes social restructure. Uh, it's a very big way of saying, but for example, when we had uh, FND in the UK in uh, 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 not too long ago, uh, what it caused was uh, social restructure. Uh, uh, people moved from the countryside. We had an inability to, uh, to have tourism. It, those are the kind of issues that you face. Uh, market access, non-tariff trade barrier. Do unto others as you would uh, have done to you. Uh, it can be a lot more complex, though. In fact, some of the things that we get into now when we look at uh, sustainability is to realize uh, that this, in fact, is presenting us with an opportunity uh, for technology transfer. Uh, the whole uh, sustainability discussion, uh, which we began with this morning, it has an enormous, traceability has an enormous role in this process. And I use the example of Namibia. Namibia, a small country in southern Africa, uh, we are currently involved with putting some 1.6 uh, million uh, EID tags into cattle into, uh, into Namibia, uh, specifically to facilitate export to Europe. So uh, uh, allowing them to uh, uh, create a new local economy, uh, actually utilizing beef uh, is a sustainable uh, tool. Now, how would I say that? So if you have five cows, and you can sell two cows uh, for more profit than you would if you sold the five, what it does is in these small villages allows them to buy uh, medicines and foods and change diets. So it's an <coughs> example where today we think in the U.S. as uh, uh, ID as a non-tariff trade barrier, and I'm going to look at that more deeply, how it affects our economy, but it actually can have uh, a ripple effect in another way. Uh, consumer confidence. Uh, the BSE outbreak in the UK uh, was the first driver for a mandatory program in, uh, uh, that we're familiar with for ID. Um, how many of you have been kicked by a cow with BSE? So that gives me an advantage over you. I lost about a third of my herd to BSE uh, in, uh, in the UK at this time. So I, I have a first-hand uh, impression of what it is like to watch a disease change your market. Uh, quite dramatically. Uh, in reality, the UK had to establish a traceability program principally to allow it to sell beef, not just internally, but to Europe. And once that began the whole process, uh, Europe immediately became a, uh, a completely traceable program over a period of time. Uh, the peace and safe is something that you, uh, you, you, you have to recognize and understand when you're dealing with consumers. Uh, this, is not a, this is not a tradable subject. It is something that is assumed, and traceability is part of that process. So global standards, so a quick discussion is their global standards. In reality, the, uh, the OIE uh, and Codex, uh, they have the mandate to set standards, and if you want to spend time uh, uh, studying OIE, they do have a set of uh, global standards that uh, started in May 2007 onwards, but each year they will meet somewhere uh, uh, and discuss it. Um, but uh, it currently provides a background that some of the uh, 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 developing countries are looking at those standards as a, as a way of saying we are doing something that meets uh, uh, a world-recognized uh, standard. So uh, I'm going to split this uh, in, in looking at countries and how they operate into customers, uh, exporters, and there's a couple on the end that are what I will describe as transitional. 
So Europe, my very good friends, so all 27 countries in Europe today have mandatory ID for cattle and sheep and some of them for swine. There are common rules. So the EU government gives you one basic framework. And then each country will modify those rules according to their own needs. No less than the global rule, and frequently more than. Let me give you an example of that. So we have individual tagging at birth, but in Holland and the Netherlands, that's three days. In Spain, it's 14 days. So you see uh, there is some small differences uh, that you would uh, see between countries. Uh, each country in cattle has animal movement recording, but with a paper passport. And the paper passport, for those of you who've been through this process, is mind-bogglingly dense in terms of the effort it takes to run that system. Uh, the true visual tags that we are using uh, uh, are relatively cheap to buy compared to EID, uh, but uh, when you notice what we are doing uh, uh, in sheep, when sheep commenced in July last year with a mandatory ID, they went immediately to EID. So originally all the breeding stock, but now in certain countries all the newborn, are using EID immediately. Why? Fast, cheap. And uh, uh, I use the example of uh, the UK, uh, my very good friends, I have lots of colleagues uh, still there, occasionally they let me back in, which is pleasant. My mother and father still live there, so it's a good thing to see them. Um, but the British Cattle Movement Service has some 800 people working there. 800 people. In Canada, with a similar sized uh, cattle population, you have between ATQ and CCIA maybe 100 to 110. It gives you an indication of the difference of what happens with a paper-based system. So, uh, another customer, a very important customer, this is Japan, and South Korea to some extent follows the same rules, they model themselves on Europe, their traceability system. So, uh, tagging at birth, uh, double visual tags, animal movement recording, uh, and uh, legal penalties. Japanese with law this way. In other words, if you don't conform, we'll put you in jail. And which they do. So uh, conformance is very high. <laughs> uh, but food safety is cultural. Again, something to recognize. We can argue <coughs> as much as we would like in court about what we would like them to do and not to do. But food safety is cultural. So uh, they are a major importer. In reality, you can try and appeal to the minimum but their consumers demand traceability as part of food safety. And I'm going to look at their uh, food safety commission effects a little bit later. Regionally, you need to be aware, apart from South, uh, uh, South Korea and what South Korea is doing, uh, Taiwan and Thailand have uh, some limited developing systems. But in China, uh, we've been in China as Allflex for, uh, for more than 18, 19 years. Uh, we are uh, uh, the largest player inside that market. Uh, and what you will see is that the central government is now talking about some form of traceability system um, and uh, then you have uh, provincial uh, differences looking at this. So uh, very intriguing as you watch uh, a necessity uh, with China investing phenomenal amounts of money in growing its technologies. Most all of you in technology companies in swine and dairy and feedlot uh, and many of you will have branches that you have opened in China, they are importing the technologies, uh, and China is doing a lot. So it's something to watch. Uh, so exporters. Who's the first one that I like to talk about? Is Australia. Uh, Australia, mandatory cattle ID before movement on the farm. Uh, so they are recording 30 million movements of cattle per year over 99% reliable. They have hundreds of their uh, sale yards, packing plants, uh, uh, are equipped with uh, high flow RFID readers. Nobody talks about it anymore. It was one of the original signs that was seen on uh, uh, sale yard in Victoria. In other words, that was your, uh, your premise ID card. And then you would move to sale yards eventually that said no tag, no sale. Now uh, we're moving to sheep. Uh, and it will begin in the state of Victoria. Interestingly, if we look at the evolution in Australia, it began in the dairy state of Victoria. Victoria looked for a way to separate itself, to sell additional value, and the state of Victoria began. It is very common in countries to have 
cultural differences. So when you are in Victoria, it is not the same culture as if you're in Queensland. For Queensland, see Texas. In other words, there is a strong uh, beef cattle, uh, independent nature. Whereas in Victoria, we are a lot more dairy based, uh, we think in different ways. And so at the beginning, we sheep in there, and there's a lot of sheep. Uh, they are a key Asian exporter. In other words, some of our critical markets that we look at are their critical markets. And one of the things that they do is they use traceability to appear to that cultural need. You've all heard the story of uh, being able to go uh, take a barcode and, uh, in, a, in a Japanese supermarket and take it back to the farm. Uh, many of you will have seen McDonald's uh, 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 a promotional video in, uh, in Japan where they actually show uh, the EID tag back to the cattle in Australia. In other words, it is something that is utilized consistently as a tool. Uh, in New Zealand, uh, they are a critical exporter of dairy products and sheep. And New Zealand is a, pro uh, a country uh, moving towards national ID programs for both dairy and sheep. Uh, this was something that I saw in the state of Victoria which made me realize that uh, uh, my people did rest in Australia and did a very good job. This is a good idea. There is a big sofa in my office. Canada. So uh, national ID has been mandatory since 2002 in Canada. Began in an evolutionary way with uh, uh, tagging at birth with visually I ID tags and then moving on. They moved to EID in 2005, but of course, we have provincial differences. You have uh, Western Canada. Some people would say it uh, stops when you get into Ontario, others when you get into Quebec. It depends on your, uh, your attitude of mind. Uh, but in Western Canada, we have uh, uh, a simple system compared to Quebec. And Quebec with ATQ, you have one of the most advanced all species traceability programs that there is in the world today. ATQ, cattle, sheep, pigs, goats, progressing with deer, everything is uh, identified, all movements are tracked, uh, and it's all the ID. Uh, with pigs we are using some lock movement with, uh, with uh, uh, tattoo, uh, but the process is the same. And now what you're seeing is the progression in Western Canada with uh, two traceability. And traceability is not the same as identification. So in Western Canada, we began by putting tags in cattle. Before they were born, before they left the farm, you put a tag in it. But then, the only time that number was recorded was at retirement, when the animal died. Bookend system, very simple bookend system. That's Western Canada. This is not ATQ, this is not Quebec. Now, what are we moving to? All feedlots over a thousand cattle will be called movements in. That has started, it's begun, it's all the ID. Uh, now we're moving uh, toward, and we have the date in 2012, and the date is important, where movements will have to be recorded in the sale yards. So we've been doing a lot of work with high flow systems and sale yards. And the government is investing a lot of money in this. Now you have the latest is Quebec and Western Canada are looking to see how they can marry some of the systems they have together. How they can reduce costs and share some of their systems together. So if you took an evolution from 2002, over a 10 year period that we'll be looking at, you'll have seen an overarching rule. What created the overarching rule? It was the cattlemen, the dairymen, going to government and saying, uh, we want to do this, because we want to export, we recognize our markets want it, uh, create a small rule. And they created a small rule that brings those that don't want to do it alongside. And then each of the provinces adjusted to that rule just in the same way as Europe did. And now over a 10 year period, you see, you see them coming together. South America. South America actually although we see them as a competitor for export, is becoming transitional. Uruguay is distinctly and always will be an export competitor. Uh, you have uh, 
uh, 11 million cattle and uh, six, seven million people, maximum. So when you have uh, when you have that disparity, you have meat. You're going to export. So Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and Uruguay have that disparity today, and they have a lot of natural resources. So they will always be in the export business. China, Japan, a lot of places in Asia you've discussed will always be importers of product because they have more people than they have land mass. So this is a dynamic that exists. So mandatory ID since September 06. Uh, full traceability is on target for September this year and they will hit it. And uh, everybody takes part. Even the president of Uruguay goes to the uh, meat uh, conference in Shanghai to talk about how unique and special his, uh, his traceability program is. Because the whole country, this is part of what they do. It's in their culture. They're cattle people. Brazil. Brazil is very complicated. Very complicated. It's in transition. Brazil uh, began in 2004 uh, under CISBOV to create a program for export with a target for Europe. So they tried to mimic the European system to an extent, uh, but it was limited in what it did. Uh, and not only that, it actually wasn't terribly well organized. And uh, here we have a great example of traceability is a non-tariff trade barrier being used to its full. It failed the uh, Food and Veterinary Office inspection in 2009. Who are the Food and Veterinary Office? Food and Veterinary Office for Europe are the ones who are able, under WTO, for example, to visit a country and say, you are not doing to the standards you want of our people. Therefore, you cannot export to us. This was a wake-up call. And a very real one, because this organization has the teeth to stop you exporting. I talked about uh, the Food Safety Commission in Japan. So they have, through their uh, mandate, the auspices to audit what you do in a country, and they have the mandate to stop you out, to shut you out. It exists. And it is simply that. It's not a specific law, it's not a tariff, but it's a trade barrier. And you have to cross those hurdles, otherwise they will lean on you. So it's true. So back to Brazil, what did they do? Uh, now only about 2,000 farms, although it's some 10 million cattle, uh, use a CISPOV system. Uh, specifically, because each farm is now individually accredited. In reality, it's not very dissimilar to some of our ASB uh, PVP programs. But where do we want to go? There are two new programs in discussion. Uh, one is a modified form of, uh, of CISBOV, um, and the other is uh, a federation of exporters trying to create an Australian model. So at the moment, there isn't any real consensus. Uh, you have precisely, as uh, uh, Marcin indicated, some uh, states looking at uh, different traceability programs. Santa Catarina, uh, Tarana will be two as an example. Uh, looking at systems uh, more for animal health basis as well. Uh, so it's, it's complicated, but they have other programs being driven based, for example, on uh, uh, traceability. Did these animals come from the deforested area? If you look, for example, at McDonald's latest traceability statement or sustainability statement, they will only buy from animals from a sustainable uh, process. That means not from the Amazon. You have also in, uh, inside Brazil itself, a growing middle class. You've seen the RIA uh, increase against the US dollar to the perspective now where in fact frequently meat is more expensive in Brazil than it is in the EU. So uh, as we have a growing middle class inside Brazil who are consuming more meat themselves, their position as an exporter of beef begins to vacillate. Not of pork, not of chicken, but of beef. And this is an interesting uh, uh, note, to mayor, <laughs> note to bear, because Argentina is another country we have considered a powerhouse of exports for the longest period of time, uh, particularly into Europe. Uh, Europe, uh, Northern Europe effectively outsourced its uh, beef production uh, to South America. Not so easy now. So uh, Argentina, a mandatory ID system, visual tags before entering commerce, uh, 
Uh, but politics, uh, when you have uh, now a limit that you can only export 15% of your beef from Argentina, there is the potential for Argentina to be a net meat importer in the next five to ten years. Who could imagine this enormous change? But it is a real change. And if you listen to the papers presented this morning, you have an understanding of why. And it actually plays colossally into the geopolitical change of food and food security. Regional activity, uh, we see Chile, Paraguay, Colombia, all with the, uh, the beginnings of, uh, of national ID programs. Mexico, uh, just south of the border, under Sagapa, uh, they've had a program uh, effectively to uh, promote rural stability, uh, food safety. Um, uh, it was originally dairy orientated, uh, subsidized tags going in. In fact, uh, for years we put about 10 million tags in, so it's not nothing. It means that uh, the Mexicans have been doing a lot more than you realize uh, in this process. But it's an incomplete program. Uh, one of the errors in the subsidy program was to go to a farm and say, uh, uh, you have uh, 200 cows, I will buy tags for 100 for you, as the government. And what did the farmer do? Tag 100 cows. It means the other 100 cows had no ID, no traceability. So it was not an effective system that way. So what you see now is uh, uh, you also saw regional programs in Chihuahua. The Sycamore program that they uh, developed for export to the US from Chihuahua uh, is an electronic CBI based system. ID, electronic CBI, everything. And it was designed by the Chihuahua Cattlemen's Association going to the local government saying, can you mandate it? And all 365,000 cattle in Chihuahua are ID'd and go through Sycamore. They're in the electronic database. And now uh, uh, the people at the port of entry in Santa Maria, they're trained to use the Sycamore database for when cattle move from Chihuahua into the United States. Uh, there is a national program in discussion, but it is Mexico. No. United States. What do we have in the United States? I want to give you, my friends and colleagues, Michigan. They have just completed four years of mandatory animal identification for cattle. Four years. It was driven by TB, split state status originally, and the need for movement from interstate and also confidence of moving to states around the sides. All cattle must be EID tagged and have a certificate of veterinary inspection before they leave. Today we've put more than 3 million tags in. I spoke with Kevin Kirk uh, at the NBA this morning. See, how are you doing, Kevin? He's marvelous. He said, uh, the bullet holes have healed, um, <laughs> but we're in good shape. Unfortunately, uh, MBA has no money to send me to, uh, to the NIAA, so I have to speak on his behalf. Uh, we have all the sail yards, all the packing plants, equipment readers. We record all the movements electronically. Uh, it follows basically the original NIS plan, which was the USAIP plan, which was spawned by uh, the very good people at the NIA. So in essence, that's what it is. It's a four-year trial with three, mi three million tags gone in. Uh, I have to tell you uh, that nobody's died and nobody's gone out of business. So when the United States is looking for a pilot project, you have one and it works. Congratulations, Michigan. So, global commonalities. Implementation follows a typical uh, uh, pattern. There has to be a local demand. There's got to be a reason to do it. There needs to be rules and standards uh, and a timeline. So, what's the demand? It could be response to local drivers. I give you the example of the UK and BSE. Uh, voluntary. Uh, if you have a voluntary system, it's basically the need of the individual. In the US, we have a voluntary system. If I want to export, I take part in an ASB or a PVP. Very simple. CISPOV. Uh, regulatory. The need of the many. Uh, Canada. Australia. We all want to be together. We all want to export. I need everybody to do it. Uh, and it is always an industry-government partnership. I firmly believe the reason in the US we do not have an ID system is we simply don't have industry desire. Until we have industry desire, uh, we will not have this. Rules. 
Everybody needs to know who, what, where, and when. Very simple. Farmers are very simple people. Being a farmer, I can tell you this. We will do the right thing. How, how you do things is something that, as I've discussed to you, is something that evolves. You begin, you learn, you evolve. But you can see it takes five, ten years, and it never ends. So don't get hung up on the how too much. Standards. <laughs> uh, technology selection for data. Uh, there are multiple routes uh, for data. We've had lots of discussions here. Typically, it is uh, uh, either a state or national. Uh, rarely is it private. Uh, um, identification devices, there's almost only one type. Uh, you might get a mix of an EID and a visual tag, uh, but in almost all circumstances, unless it's transitional, like Canada going from visual to EID, it is one technology type. Uh, this is a slide I used here, I think, four or five years ago. In other words, the impacts of technology neutrality uh, when you're at multiple uh, cattle handling points trying to deal with different types of ID creates confusion, cost, inefficiencies. And nothing we don't know. So in practice, what does the rest of the world do? It makes life very simple. It is this tag, this type, this color. You know, uh, we, uh, we drop ship ID tags to 2.2 uh, to million farms around the world for regulatory. It's about a million uh, 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 regulatory tags we produce uh, every, day, every business day. It's a lot. When you think about that, that's a lot. And uh, so if you go to our uh, main facilities, you will see these long production lines. And it's uh, automated. So the raw material arrives. It goes uh, along a long line to an uh, uh, injection molding machine. The tag comes out the other end. It is marked to an individual farm, packaged to an individual farm, and nobody touches it. Highly automated. Very clever. Because it's what type, what size, what color. Low cost. So uh, the trend is moving, of course, from these paper-based systems to RFID because it's lower cost and more efficient. Those of you who have tried to uh, read uh, uh, visual tags will realize that this is not always so easy. And as we are moving toward metal tags, you have, uh, you have my blessings. I shall pray for you most nights. Um, so uh, uh, other uh, things that we think about with uh, ID tags uh, are distribution. Where do I get it? Uh, you have to decide, uh, is it something I get from my local store, which I can do in Western Canada, or is it something that I have to get from the regulator, as I do in, uh, in Quebec? Those are decisions that you will make in your standards. And there is hybrids of everything. Australia is an example. Uh, in Australia, I will do a deal with my distributor on my tags, uh, but I need to hold the tags. The distributor gives the order to, uh, uh, to the nice people at Orflex, uh, who send the, send the, produce the tags right to that farm and send them direct to the farm. Timelines. Uh, effectively, if you have no timeline, there is no program. If there isn't a date, a date certain, uh, nobody does anything. Uh, you get the few early adopters, the altruistic among us, and then it stops. So uh, I can show you country after country. This is, uh, this is the timeline. This is the adoption rate. It's like that, every time. So uh, no timeline, no law, no program. So in summary, lots of summaries. Participation is determined by your individual need. Voluntary or by the need of many. Regulatory. You choose. Voluntary will clearly not fulfill each driver's requirement. Uh, a small closed loop systems, PVPs and so on and so forth, work for export, but does not work for animal health uh, and disease control and multiple other methods. If you go to the OIE, uh, you'll see six different reasons why uh, you need animal, uh, animal ID, and I'm sure we can come up with more. Idea movement recording, shared responsibilities. Uh, typically, they receive money from, uh, from the state or a cost share, uh, and none of those uh, in reality are voluntary. Uh, in every country, it is the same. We have a little black book at Orflex, which is uh, uh, the, the hate mail. Um, countries with the program uh, would not give them up now that they've got them. In other words, um, I use another example of that uh, in the, uh, the U.S. dairy industry. U.S. dairy industry uh, voluntarily 
uh, large herds adopted the EID, very largely for a management process. And even in the economic crisis that they went through, those herds using it didn't give it up because it gives them value. General level of management performance increases. It's amazing you go to a country that starts a new process and they learn something. What's the first thing they learn? How many cattle they've got? Very odd. There's always more than you think. Uh, future drivers. <laughs> Food security becomes home security. Uh, what an interesting world we live in. So uh, the Director General of the uh, FAO made this uh, in November the 23rd. Uh, Investments in agriculture must grow because the rise in food prices makes structural changes urgent. Uh, if we don't do something about the price of food in the Gulf countries, uh, we're going to have a problem. And uh, on January the 14th, what did we get? Something that we are beginning to get a handle on, and somebody said in one of the presentations this morning, if we're not able to implement the technologies we utilize, we leave 300 million people hungry. If you have food insecurity, you create homeland insecurity. I don't like using fear. Fear is a bad thing to communicate. It is simply an example of reality. So, future drivers will call sustainability. And I'll begin with the sustainability number one, which is sustaining the human population. And in order to feed the nine billion, what is clear, we're going to use more technology and not less. We're going to farm more intensively, not less. But we'll be more accountable, period, for every input and every output. I am glad to say that ID is at the very beginning of all that.